Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? You know, the wonder of it all is that on a program like this, we can have the most super finest authority imaginable, and that authority is the Bible. Each time as we open up the Open Forum program, I can't help but marvel that again on this new program, we're going to have the Bible as our authority. How can that be? Because the Bible is just not any old book. It is the Word of Almighty God. It is God's Word to mankind, and therefore it is absolutely true and trustworthy and relevant, and, and it gets into all kinds of areas of life that are very, very important to mankind. And as a matter of fact, it is the authority that judges all of us. It is a law book that God has given, and, and uh, we better become acquainted with it, because if we, if we don't become saved, it means that we're going to have to answer to God as to how we lived in, a, uh, 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 in regards... Uh, to, to the Bible, the Word of God. What a wonderful, wonderful book it is. What a wonderful privilege we have of being able to join our resources and uh, our monies and our time and uh, send this gospel into all the world. That's exactly what God tells us to do. Go ye into all the world with the gospel. And Family Radio is a wonderful means by which we can achieve that. And so uh, we have to consider it's a grand opportunity when we can combine our resources in order to do this. But this is your program. Now, before we take our first call, we have a question here from a listener in Nicaragua. Of course, it came in the Spanish language. The question is, uh, when we compare Matthew 22, verse 27 to 30, and Isaiah 65, 20 to 25, how can we explain that there will not be marriage anymore? Because it sounds like there will still be more children in the new heaven and the new earth of the book of Isaiah. Well, you know, it is true that in the Gospel of Matthew, God does say that, uh, that in heaven we neither marry nor are given in marriage. Excuse me. The fact is that the fact is that uh, there are, are no children being born in heaven, and we don't marry and give any, or, or we don't marry, nor do we uh, uh, give our uh, children to marriage. But the uh, Isaiah 65 has a very peculiar statement, a very uh, that seems to imply we will have children. Because it says in the new heaven and the new earth, uh, in verse 20, there shall be no more hence an infant of days, that is, an infant that dies very young, nor an old man that hath not filled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. We wonder, what is God saying? Well, first of all, uh, it, it talks about a child dying a hundred years old. Well, that's alien to the new heaven and the new earth. There is no death there. That, uh, that means we have to understand this spiritually. It has to have a spiritual meaning. The fact is that the phrase hundred years, like the phrase thousand years, is a... Uh, is a symbol of the completeness of whatever God has in view, whatever time God has in view. The number hundred or the number thousand signifies completeness. 
Now, what is the expectation in the new heaven and the new earth for, for uh, longevity? Well, it is forevermore. And so immediately we can say the child uh, uh, sh uh, shall die, uh, shall die uh, only after he has completely come to the end of eternity. Because that's how, that is the expectation of everyone who's in the new heaven and the new earth. But eternity is forevermore. You never get there. And so the child will never die. And this is a, this is a picture, a portrait, a statement, a figure of speech to emphasize that there is no death in, uh, in the new heaven and the new earth. It is not a statement to indicate that there are children. Uh, it's re-emphasizing what it says earlier, there shall no more be an infant of days. That is, there will be no death, no death. Everyone living there, uh, and, and to, for babies to die, that's as common as grass throughout the history of the world. And, and so it, uh, it is simply emphasizing that will never happen in the new heaven and the new earth. Likewise, nor an old man that has not filled out his days. Uh, uh, here on this earth, uh, we, we finally die as we grow, uh, grow older. The time comes when we die. But the fact is, there won't be anybody that will die. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I, the grand picture is, there is no death. Now, the other uh, ominous thing in this verse, as long as we're looking at it, is that the sinner, a hundred years old, shall be accursed. Well, now, uh, remember the hundred years old is the completeness of the timetable, whatever God has. What is God's timetable for eternal damnation? I've already said it. Eternal. Et eternity. The sinner will exist in hell under the wrath of God forevermore. And forevermore he shall be accursed. There is not, never a time in the future when finally God says, Look, you have suffered enough. You have suffered enough. Now I have some, a different plan for you. The fact is what God has ordained will take place precisely uh, and that is that the damnation is eternal in character. So this is a very ominous statement. Well, thank you, Nicaragua, for that very interesting question. And now we're going to go to our open forum lines and take our first telephone call. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Oh, Brother Camping, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good. I had wanted to ask a question on um, divorce and marriage. Um, in the Bible where it says um, well, when we divorce and um, we marry again, we commit adultery. I was wondering, when it comes to um, God's divine law, are we still married to that person? Well, yes. You see, the Bible also says, and this is a fundamental principle that God lays down, uh, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, the wife is bound to her, by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And so even though there's been a legal divorce insofar as the uh, law of the land is concerned, God still looks upon those two people as having a married relationship. Although, the Bible does insist that if you have had a, a legal divorce of this kind, which is not recognized by God uh, ultimately, but nevertheless, now you've married someone else, you cannot go back to your first husband or your first wife. Oh, because my, uh, my ex-husband, he did get married again. He did marry again, so yes. now you are to remain single. And if you would marry again, then it would be a, a, an act of rebellion against God. And because you love the Lord, you are saying, well, Lord, if that's the way it is, 
then I'm not going to have romance on my mind. I want to serve the Lord. I want to do your will. Thank you, Brother Camping. That's what I needed to know. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, we spoke about a month ago, and we ran out of time. And uh, you were you had quoted Romans saying that there is none who is righteous. I had suggested that perhaps o not only the elect are to be saved. I, I believe that that uh, point of view is consistent with Scripture. And you had stated that Romans... I, I forget the verse, and I'm in the car, but I forget the verse that you uh, quoted, but it's you're very fond of quoting it. Have I got the... Uh, the uh, yeah, it's Romans correct? chapter 3, but what is the point that you're making? I, I believe that your, your interpretation of Romans chapter 3 is incorrect. Well, the, what, but what is, let's just read Romans 3. It's the languages. This is the way God is speaking. It's not my words. All we have to do is look, look at what it says. It says in Romans 3, in, uh, in verse 10, um, or uh, uh, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. That's not very difficult to understand, is it? They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And, and then we couple that, for example, with statements like John 6, verse 44, where God says, No man can come to me except the Father draw him and so on and so what's what's difficult about that well no one can come to the father except he draw him perhaps god has drawn everyone it doesn't say that everyone who god draws will come to him it merely says that no one who hasn't been drawn can well, come to the father and wait 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 no. and my original point was about romans 3 the context of romans 3 is paul is talking to the circumcised and explaining to them that they cannot find salvation through the law and through circumcision and so these statements about there is none righteous and that there is none that seeketh after God he means to say that there is none who are good in God's eyes I mean well, that's consistent with the context of Romans 3 well that but you see in as he's teaching uh, as he's uh, speaking about the Jews uh, the fact is the principles apply to everyone to everyone now, why does he say, why does he say in Ephesians chapter 1, why does God put it this way in verse 3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Now that also is a very plain statement that God has chosen certain ones to become saved. And he's predestinated them to become saved. I that the Bible says that he has predestinated some people for salvation. It, it, Paul could be very well speaking to the original founders of the church who were not privy to the gospel as written in the Bible, oh. and that those people had been predestinated by God oh, and oh, left oh, any of them should Excuse me, excuse me. We have to remember the Bible isn't just for, uh, just for a few people. The Bible is for the whole human race. These are principles, the whole Bible. That's why the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, and so on. And so the, the, the fact is that God here is setting forth principles that he hath chosen us in him. Now, to, to back that up, if you go to Re Revelation chapter uh, 13, 
There you read in verse 8 in Revelation 13, and it's talking about those who get uh, get uh, uh, snared by Satan, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, that's Satan, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, God is saying very pointedly, there are certain ones who were never named, and so they will get snared. And that, that, that totally agrees, totally agrees with what we're reading in Ephesians chapter 1. More than that, we again have to keep in mind what is required for salvation. What is required for salvation? Is it something that we do, that we can somehow get it worked out? What really is required? I'm asking you the question, what is required for salvation? The, uh, we must have lost our caller. The fact is, to become saved, uh, God has to pay for, has to lay all the sins of the one that he plans to save on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now, if all of our if if uh, if he is going to make provision that just anybody who calls on him can become saved, then ahead of time he would have to lay uh, upon the Lord Jesus Christ the sins of the whole of every human being. But had he done that, then nobody could go to hell because those sins would have all been paid for. And so you end up with an impossible situation. But thank you for calling, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes. Um, I had a question. It's about um, tithing. I'd like to know how do you view that now in um, today's church? I mean, it's just like everybody is having a different point of view towards that and uh, I'd, I'd like to be clear on that how would you um, well, do you, that you see here's the, the the fact is that during the church age the assignment or the task of evangelizing the world was laid upon the church the church, the local congregation they were to be uh, using uh, uh, their efforts as best as possible to get the gospel out into the world. And so it was very proper for believers to be a member in that congregation. In fact, they were encouraged to be the, a member and to tithe and bring their offerings so that those monies could be used to further the church's responsibility to share the gospel with others. That was That was the the setup that existed. But now that the church age is, is ended and, the, and God has assigned the task of evangelizing the world to individuals, there's no point, uh, and, and he's not using the churches anymore, well then that's not the place that we would want to bring our tithes or our offerings. So we want to, uh, uh, we still want to use our lives to the highest possible degree to send out the gospel so then then we are to use our ties uh, uh, to uh, support uh, ministries that that uh, are outside of the church and who have the true gospel and have a real desire to send the gospel into the world and are really carrying that out and uh, and uh, this uh, uh, this is not an idea that uh, uh, this is being taught in order to take money away from the churches, that isn't the point at all. The point is is that that we, the, the goal of the true believer is, starts with the fact, I want to be obedient to Christ. Secondly, uh, as uh, a believer, I am called to be an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. And and to represent the Lord Jesus Christ to this world. And throughout the church age, uh, God works through the local congregation. And so I gladly gave my offerings and my tithes so that, uh, that uh, they could carry out that program. But now, 
given the fact that the church age has come to an end, their work is finished, and now God is using doing it all by in, individuals. Now I can spend my money to buy tracts and stand on the corner and pass out tracts. I can use my money to provide Bibles that I can give out. I can use my money to to uh, uh, support uh, 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 the collective effort of a great many others as we buy radio stations and and radio time to broadcast o all over the world. Uh, but but I still want to still use my funds to get the gospel out. Okay, so it's not man mandatory to us. I mean, it's just like we're not... I, uh, I wouldn't be under a, a curse if I um, chose not to sign in at, at my church, right? Is that, you know? It, it, you, you would not be under a curse uh, if under, you did what? Under, uh, under a curse if I chose not to, um, uh, you know, pay the tie at the church. But well, of course not. Of course not. You, you, you. Uh, uh, the, 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 the fact is that that uh, the the church no longer has any uh, any spiritual standing with the Lord. The, the God has indicated that the church age has come to an end. It has faithfully more or less faithfully served the Lord for over 1950 years and and people have even been burned at the stake in their faithfulness to uh, to uh, uh, as members of the church but now that era has come to an end it would be very much like what happened in the days of the apostles prior to the a resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ into heaven, God worked through the synagogues and through the temple. And when people brought their uh, tithes, they brought them into the temple or into the synagogue. And that was all very proper. But then, when the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts 2, uh, so that now God is going to use the churches that are are going to spring up all over the world they were not to bring their money into the synagogues anymore because god was not using the synagogues now their their tithes and their offerings should made should be available to the churches so that the church could, could get on with the task god had assigned to it to them to evangelize the world but once the church age has come to an end again we find that there's a shift, a major shift. God is not using the churches anymore, but he's using individuals. And so now we have to think as an individual. How can I spend my money that I want to donate uh, to get the uh, gospel into the world most wisely? I can buy tracts or I can buy Bibles. I can, I can support a ministry like Family Radio where many of us combine together to... to uh, uh, do things that we cannot do individually. Uh, these are the proper places in 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 which we uh, now will lay our life down on the altar of service. Okay, I have another another question for you. How about uh, communion? Communion should we um, as as um, church today carry that on? Like uh, when Jesus was on earth, uh, he. Um, he did that with his disciples. So should we uh, move on with that? Because I have a friend of mine, so he 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 has a um, totally different you know point of view of that. Yeah. If well, he goes to a church and then he sees they're doing that, he's like, what are they doing? So I'm like, it is in, in the Bible. I'm yeah. reading it. Why shouldn't you do it? I mean, if we um, are well, Christian, yeah. shouldn't we have the the same you know point yeah, well, of view on that? Shouldn't we do the same thing? Yes. Well, let me explain. You know. Before the Passover, and that was at the beginning of the uh, when God began to utilize a a uh, an organized uh, uh, organization, and that was the nation of Israel. Then God introduced the Passover that was to be observed. It was part of the ceremonial law. Now, prior to the institution of the Passover. Uh, the, the people just worshipped as individuals. Noah worshipped as an individual. 
uh, and uh, and uh, Enoch and uh, Abraham and so on. They worshipped as individuals. There was no Passover. The Passover required an organization. It required that there be spiritual oversight over it, and that was part of the nation of the ceremonial law that was laid on the nation of Israel. Then, when God shifted from the organization of the nation of Israel to the church, to the local co churches, he also gave them a very similar uh, uh, ceremonial law, namely the Lord's table. It's, it was similar, it was different in many ways, but it was also similar. It was instituted, as a matter of fact, at the same evening that Christ observed the last Passover, he introduced the Lord's Supper. And it, too, has to be administered by uh, those who have spiritual oversight. It was given to the churches and congregations as a ceremonial law that uh, get, was a picture of what is required in salvation, just like water baptism is the same uh, idea. It's a part of the ceremonial law. Now that the church age has come to an end, there is no one who has any spiritual authority to oversee these things. So we're back where we were with Abraham or with Noah. We don't observe these particular things any longer. Uh, they were never an integral part of our salvation. They were simply uh, portraits or pictures of what is required in salvation. But now... We focus entirely on the Word of God. We focus on the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. And that is what God is using to do is saving, and, 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 uh, and God is in charge of it all together. But thank you for calling and sharing. And let's pause for this message, and then we'll go to our next caller. Oh, I'm sorry. I closed off a few seconds early. But we'll just pause for a moment, then we'll go to our next caller. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, I uh, wanted to make a comment about the last caller. I think it's a good example of churches gone apostate, where they're actually telling believers that they're stealing from God if they are not uh, submitting their tithes onto the church. Um, I don't know if you'd like to comment on that before I go ahead with my question. Well, this they utilize a verse that they find in the Malachi, and and that actually is an Old Testament verse that has to do with not giving to the churches, but giving to the uh, to the nation of Israel. That is to the synagogues and the temple. That that, if technically speaking, that's what that verse is speaking about. We read there in uh, verse eight of chapter three of Malachi: "Will ye, a man rob God? Yea, ye have robbed me. Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings." Now, this actually was literally pointing to the bringing of tithes in the uh, during the the uh, synagogue or the nation of Israel age, rather than during the church age. But then the uh, then the uh, 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 churches have applied that. Uh, now the tithes and offerings ought to be coming to the churches, and they were correct about that. And and in a in a certain sense, they could make that application. But now we can make the next application. Will a man rob God now that the church age is over and, and we still have to evangelize the world through individuals? Are we now going to withhold our tithes and offerings from those, uh, those who are, are uh, trying to bring the gospel as individuals, whether we do it collectively through a ministry like Family Radio, or we do it individually as we buy tracts or Bibles in, and, uh, uh, in order to send the gospel out. But uh, the fact is that, that uh, we are mandated. We do have a command. Every believer has a command to 
uh, g g bring the gospel to the world and we just don't do that by thinking about it we have to put our money or our time where our I where the command is pointing and and uh, then that task will be done um, in a similar context I wanted to ask about rebellion um, I've heard you mention many times that uh, those who are still in sin are in rebellion to God and I know for from experience that um, I, I'm personally still a babe in Christ still being fed by his milk I still have not been transformed completely um, would you still consider me to be in rebellion well the, the, really there's no middle ground either we're saved or we're not saved uh, at the moment of salvation when God applies the Word of God to our hearts we instantly receive a brand new resurrected soul we are raised with Christ in our spirit essence now it doesn't mean that we're going to uh, uh, be living as as uh, rightly before God as we will later on as we grow in grace we are a new we are a new child of God and and we uh, there's many things we don't understand uh, what God's will is and but as we go along because of our delight in the Word of God we read it carefully we meditate upon it we're praying for wisdom we're praying for obedience and slowly on we become we find that this uh, this action that we've been performing in the past really is sin this doctrine that we held we realize it's a wrong doctrine so it's sin and and we make correction we never we never become perfect we never arrive finally but uh, because that won't happen until we receive our glorified spiritual body which we won't receive until Christ comes again but uh, but we're either saved and have a new resurrected soul which is uh, in which we never want to sin again or we're not saved or there's no in-between ground there I understand thank you what what is the fear of the Lord because uh, well are you afraid of God's wrath um, well, as a believer as a child of God are you afraid of his wrath no I'm not afraid of God's wrath but fear of God is to have a very healthy awe and respect of who God is uh, to tremble before his word because uh, this uh, who is God he's his almighty sovereign uh, uh, who who, uh, who rules over this whole universe who spoke and brought it into being who is the only one who uh, can save anybody uh, who has given us his word and therefore uh, when I am in the presence of God and this uh, and we are every time we or particularly when we open the Word of God we're going to listen very carefully we're going to respect it very greatly and if we find sin in our life we realize uh, no God isn't going to send me to hell but how can it be that I would offend his eternal majesty who is so great and who has loved me so much and uh, there is just that kind of a healthy respect and awe and reverence for God and and we don't we don't take him for granted for a moment oh thanks be to God thank you thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello yes I, I have a question I'd like to ask the, uh, the 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 man on the radio. You're uh, you're talking to him. Go ahead with your call. Um. Yes. Uh, I go to Bethel Assembly of God, and my minister has told me that those who have served in the army are going to hell for killing. Is this true? That is not true. That is not true. Uh, the, the Bible gives us the illustration, for example, of Cornelius. Read. Acts chapter 10 and uh, and in Acts uh, in chapter 9 and chapter 10 I believe it's chapter 10 uh, Cornelius was a Roman centurion uh, he was a captain of a hundred men in the Roman army that was uh, a pagan army altogether 
and at times he might have to take life as he uh, as he uh, uh, served uh, as a centurion as a captain in the army and there isn't the slightest statement that if he's doing it in obedience to the government to defend the citizenry that that would be contrary to the law of uh, the law of God when we read the Old Testament we find that David uh, was a uh, was a soldier par excellence uh, and uh, we find that uh, uh, Abraham killed and Samuel killed and and uh, in other words uh, if 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 they were in the line of, of doing their work and that was pleasing to God if it required killing that and a, a judge for example who is uh, uh, supposed to uphold the law and if a man is guilty of a of a crime that is uh, is punishable by death then he has to pronounce the death sentence and and so effectively he has killed that person and thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum Mr. Camping, um, is it better to pray in your mind or aloud? Uh, we, you know, the marvelous thing is, is that God's, that God, the Holy Spirit, searches out our minds. We don't have to pray aloud at all. When we're thinking a prayer, God hears it perfectly. Fact is, the Bible says He even knows the intent of our mind before we even think it. Uh, God knows way more about what's going on in our life and what, what our desire is or what our intentions are than we ourselves know. And so uh, we can, uh, we're, a prayer, uh, most of it will be uh, in, the, in our minds. And we can pray when we're driving our automobile. We can pray when we go to bed at night and lie there. We can pray when we're uh, uh, doing the dishes. We can pray at any time and knowing, uh, just in our minds, knowing that God will hear it. That's great. Um, who do we pray to? The Father or to Jesus? Well, you know, when Jesus was asked by the apostles, how shall we pray? He said, pray, our Father who art in heaven. Now, why do we want to improve upon what God has said? Uh, certainly, when we're praying to the Father, we're praying to the Lord Jesus, because Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If any man has seen me, he has seen the Father. Uh, and uh, but but when Christ is emphasizing pray to the Father, then normally we should be praying to the Father. Although he records the prayer of the publican in Luke 18, who said, "Oh God, have mercy on me." But there is a man who who doesn't recognize God as his Father. He knows that he's an outcast. He knows that he's a sinner under the wrath of God. And so he prays, O oh God, have mercy on me. But uh, really, I, w when we pray, uh, we, we, uh, it's not the formula so much as what's going in our minds. Are we broken before God? And are we bringing him our thanks and our, uh, also our petitions? And, but always trusting, but, oh, but, oh Lord, may your will be done. I have a question. Is it worldly to give presents like on Christmas or on somebody's birthday or flowers or something? I'm sorry. Repeat that, please. Is it world, considered worldly to give somebody a present like a necklace or pre, uh, flowers or something like that? Oh, no. There's nothing wrong about that uh, to share uh, with others, to, to give them a gift of some kind if we love them or if we... I, I think they uh, this would benefit them in some way. There's there's nothing wrong with that at all. all right, great. Thank, Thank you, you for much. calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, can you explain Romans chapter one, verse thirty-two? Uh, uh, Proverbs. Romans. I'm sorry. Say it slowly. Hey, hello. Hello, Brother Camby? Oh, yeah, what is the book that you're asking? Uh, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 32. Romans chapter 1, verse 32. 
Romans. Romans oh, chapter Romans. One and Excuse me. Two. Excuse me. Romans. Romans I, chapter that's one. That's what I was trying to get. Romans chapter one, verse, verse thirty-two. 32. Okay. And Hosea seven three. And Hosea seven three. Chapter seven, verse three. All right. Let me turn to those a minute. In Hosea. Chapter 7, verse 3, we read, They made, um, mm, I have to back up and uh, pick up the context. In verse 1, When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered, and the wickedness of Samaria. For they commit falsehood, and a thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers spoileth or plundereth without. They consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. Now verse 3. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. But they are all adulterers as an oven heated by the baker. And so on. Now the in Romans 1 verse 32... We have a verse that says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You see, the fact is, they, these two passages are related, as we can understand. The fact is that wickedness is everywhere. And there are those who are delighted in seeing the wickedness of others because that also uh, gives uh, them encouragement in their own wickedness. In other words, we're wicked together. It's a mutual rebellion against God, we could put it. In Hosea chapter 7, it's talking about... Uh, the uh, the uh, king and the princes who are doing wickedly, who rejoice in the wickedness of their uh, their subjects, uh, uh, we we are wicked in this together. And if uh, if uh, let's say it the other way, if for example, I uh, uh, did very wickedly, and yet all of my friends and all of the people who knew me. Uh, didn't like wickedness at all, then I would look like an an outsider. I would look like uh, uh, someone who had a special problem of some kind, and and uh, I would uh, be alienated from the rest. But if the others are doing wickedly and I am doing wickedly, then we all support each other. We're all of one mind. And this is very much where the world is today. Yes, it is. And God bless you richly. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Uh, is this Brother Kevin? Yes. Yes, I would like to ask you about how you can say that the age of the church has ended because God made the new covenant with the church until the end of time. Well, but you have to bear in mind that we have two things in view here. First of all, there is a church that is eternal, that goes on forevermore. And that is the church that is made up of all the true believers. And we can't leave that church. We are eternally in that congregation. But God uh, uh, represents that church by local congregations, local congregations. Now, the local congregation is not forever. Uh, that is not. Uh, that is made up of both true believers and those who are not true believers. Uh, that uh, that. Uh, uh, can come to an end. For example, if we look at the seven local congregations that are named in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, eventually all of them cease to exist. They just cease to exist. They had no, 
no um, uh, guarantee of God that they would continue. In fact, God warned them, even after they had only been in existence a few decades, God warned them, if you don't uh, change your ways, he told the Ephesus church at Ephesus, I'll take away your candlestick. And he already indicated the church at Sardis was already dead. And the church at Laodicea, Laodicea, he said, if you don't change your ways, I'm going to vomit you out, and so on. And so the local congregation, that has no, no security. Uh, that can end. But the, the eternal church, the gates of hell, that is, uh, the wrath of God can never come against the true believers. But now, the question is, how is God going to represent the kingdom of God to this world? During the Old Testament period, from particularly from Moses until Jesus, it was represented by the nation of Israel. And they had no no uh, uh, guarantee either that they would be representing the kingdom of God uh, forevermore. In fact, the time came when uh, Christ uh, hung on a cross that God ended the utilization of the nation of Israel to represent the kingdom of God. And he shifted over to the local congregations like we find named in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. But they... Uh, even as the nation of Israel had no guarantee uh, that it would continue all the way to the end of the time, so neither do the local churches have any guarantee. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when we study the Bible, God did shift from the local congregations to individuals, uh, which is the way he represented the kingdom of God the first 9,000 years, 9,500 years of the history of the world. There, there was no organization representing the kingdom of God. And there is not today either. It's just individuals who have the mandate to bring the gospel to the world. But in the, in the gospel, Christ told us that he made the government with the world, not with just the church and the kingdom of heaven. Well, but when we talk about covenant... Remember, the word covenant is really a synonym for the gospel. And the gospel was assigned to the church throughout the church age. Uh, uh, they were uh, told, uh, commanded to be effectively to be the custodian of the gospel and to send that gospel into all the world. And that's what the churches were all about for over, 90, uh, over 1950 years. But, uh, but then the Bible says the time came when their work was finished. And at the same time, they had become uh, uh, in, uh, basically uh, so uh, independent of God and rewriting the rules, like the rewriting the rules of marriage and divorce and rewriting the rules of the Sunday Sabbath and rewriting the rules of of the nature of salvation and so on and so God's judgment came upon them but the sending forth of the gospel in the world did not come to an end God simply shift the, shifted the responsibility from that church organization to individuals and that's the way he's carrying it out to the end that we as individuals we either combining together in a collective uh, unit as like family radio or individually standing on the street corner passing out tracks or, or individually witnessing to our neighbor or whatever and God is blessing that word and a great multitude which no man can number are being saved but if those individuals those individuals wouldn't even exist had it not been for the church organization on the world because of the covenant of God. Well, excuse me, the covenant of God, you know, the, the, the covenant of God is simply the gospel, that we're sinners and in Christ there can be salvation. That is the covenant of God. And, and uh, uh, it's true that, the, that true believers have been driven out of the churches and to some degree are spearheading the, uh, the uh, uh, knowledge that, 
that now we have to share the gospel through individuals, but every individual who is being saved today, and there are a great multitude being saved, they in turn, uh, they continue to uh, share the gospel with others. In other words, we all, uh, as individuals, work together in sharing the gospel, but we but we do not have an organization nobody has the spiritual rule over anyone else the the largest entity is the family the father and mother still have the spiritual rule over the children that does not change but insofar as being this the custodian of the gospel that had been assigned to the churches the local congregations for over 1900 years that has come to an end and now it's just through the individuals but it's the same covenant it's the same gospel the gospel has not changed at all it's only the methodology by the the, uh, the by which god is uh, getting the gospel into the whole world saying god has abandoned his churches pardon so you're saying that god has abandoned his churches well, he has. The Bible says that. He, he says that Satan has taken his seat in the temple, the temple being uh, a figure of speech that is speaking about the local congregations. He says that uh, he that restrains has been taken out of the midst. And the one restraining Satan uh, throughout the church age is the Holy Spirit. And so, and and the church has become spiritual Babylon. It is now under the wrath of God, and so that's why it's a dangerous place to be. There, God is not saving within the churches anymore. He is doing His salvation program outside of the churches. But God is saving. Uh, the the language of Revelation 7 verse 9 and following is wonderful as God says that I saw a great multitude which no man can number that were robed with white robes and who are these that were robed with white robes the Bible asks and the answer comes in the Bible these are they who came out of great tribulation that is who were saved at this time when God's wrath has come upon the churches and congregations I see what you're saying, and I don't necessarily agree with you, but thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we? And, and please, don't agree with me. Just read the Bible. Please, don't trust me. Read the Bible. And like I tell people again and again, read Jeremiah very carefully. It is like today's newspaper. Uh, and and uh, read... Uh, uh, read again uh, uh, Revelation and read uh, 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 almost anywhere in the Bible. Read Ezekiel again very, very carefully if there were ever a time that these uh, books that are part of God's Word for uh, people today, uh, had, uh, if there's ever a time they really have meaning, it is today. But don't trust me. You read the Bible and pray for wisdom and pray for understanding. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campy. Yes. I had called earlier um, about the divorce question. Yes. And um, the most important thing that I, I forgot to ask you was that um, my ex-husband now is divorced from his second wife and that we have wanted to get married again. I mean, how does that fit? I mean, is that he... will that I understand your question and the answer is no, because your husband has married someone and then uh, if, uh, if her, the one he married or died or he divorced her or she divorced him, he cannot go back to you. Uh, that, uh, that, read Deuteronomy chapter 24, the opening verses. That's where that is explained. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, I have two questions for you today. Yes. The first question was, how do you know what how do you know what is wicked? How do we know what is which? What is wicked? What is wicked? Yeah. 
Anything, the, anything that is contrary to the law of God is wicked. Uh, tra uh, tra sin, that is another synonym for wickedness. Sin is a transgression of the law of God. It's disobedient, uh, disobedience to the law of God. Now, the whole Bible is a series of laws. The Bible is a law book, and uh, and so uh, anything that we do or think that is con or say that is contrary to the Bible, that is sin. Oh, oh, I'll get be right back with you. We're continuing with the open forum. Uh, uh, I think we have a caller on the line. Go ahead with your call. Yes, Brother Camping. My second question was. In this day and time, there's a lot of religious persecution. Believers are being persecuted left and right. What stand do we take? What does the Bible tell us about this? How, how do we face this? I mean, In this matter of persecution. Yes. Well, the Bible the, the, uh, discusses that very candidly in Matthew chapter five. Uh, let me turn to that a moment and read a few verses, and you'll get what God's assessment of this is. These are the words that God speaks. He says in verse 11 or verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is, if you are being persecuted because of your stand for Christ and because you are serving Christ, that is a blessing to you. There is a, uh, that is what you can expect if you have become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You must remember that, that uh, the, the unsaved are citizens of the kingdom of Satan, of the kingdom of the world. And, and uh, Satan is the bitter foe of Christ. So we can expect to be persecuted for righteousness sake. Then God goes on to further uh, emphasize this in verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. What is the reward? Eternal life. We are not living for a bed of roses in in uh, in this life, we are living for the fact that that uh, we have eternity with the Lord Jesus, where everything is wonderful. And uh, and he concludes this particular statement: uh, "For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you." In other words, this is as common as anything could be. That's been the nature of the gospel throughout the history of the world. Those who held the truth were persecuted. Thank you, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, good evening. My name is Noblet Maxwell. And I've been looking for this um, chapter in the Bible that goes, A Man Without God. Say it, say it. That, that it tells you about a man without God is if you live your life and die without knowing God it, it would be better if you wasn't born or like a stillbirth or like a stillbirth something of that nature um, and where do I find it? yeah I just can't think of, of the particular uh, there are, uh, is a passage or at least a or at least one passage that is refer to something like that. Um, uh, Job chapter 3, let me see if that uh, is what you're looking for in. Let, let's test that a moment. In Job chapter 3, um, No, it's, uh, it's uh, oh, 
Uh, yes, uh, in verse uh, 1, after this open Job his mouth and cursed his day, and Job spake, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, This is a man-child conceived. Let that day be darkness, let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. I don't really think that's the passage that you're looking for, uh, but uh, I'm sorry I can't help you beyond that. Thank you. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Y Hello? Hello? I can hardly hear you. Oh, well, I can hear you fine. Go ahead with your call. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Campy. Yes, you're speaking to him. Go ahead with your question. Am I speaking to him now? Yes, go ahead. My question is, have we reached the end of the world as yet? No, we, we have not reached the end of the world because the end of the world will be that Christ has come and, and uh, the believers will all have gone to be with him and the unsaved are being judged. Uh, but we're very close to that. Uh, we're moving very rapidly toward the end, but we're not there yet. I'm listening to him on the open forum and earlier this evening, and he said that that the um there isn't any church. We have reached the end of the church age. I am an avid Bible reader, student rather, and I see nowhere in the Bible where Christ says the church is going to come to an end before he returns. Because in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, I'm reading it here. He says, Go ye into all, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them, the nations, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. But you see, the Lord, Lord Jesus is speaking to all of us as believers. And that command that he's giving is given to all believers. Now, throughout the church age, it focused on the churches and congregations. They were an institution that God established according to very strict rules, as we read First Timothy 3 and elsewhere. Uh, as to how they were to operate. But finally, when we read uh, Revelation 7, we find that when the uh, 144,000, uh, that, that certain terrible things could not happen until the 144,000 were sealed. Now, the 144,000 is a number that symbolizes the complete fullness of whatever is in view. And God names 12, nation, 12 tribes of Israel and says they are, these are all the tribes of Israel. Well, because he doesn't name the tribe of Dan, we know, therefore, he's not talking about national Israel. He's talking about the Israel of God, the churches and congregations. And, and uh, when, uh, he's saying that when the complete fullness of them have been sealed, then certain terrible things will happen. The four angels will be loosed, and they will bring devastation. And those loosing of the four angels has to do with the beginning of the Great Tribulation. But then God says in verse 9 of Revelation 7, after this, that is after the complete fullness of all those who were to become saved by the churches and congregations as represented by these 12 tribes of Israel. After this, I saw a great multitude which no man can number. And then he follows that and indicates these are those who came out of great tribulation, that is, those who became saved after the four angels had been loosed that, that uh, were going to bring devastation uh, uh, that uh, that we read about in Revelation 9 and so on. And now it is true, God does not say just in plain language there will come a time when the church age is finished. But he uses a lot of language that addresses that issue 
Uh, and when we put it all together, we see this truth shining all through the Bible. That there will, for example, Jesus said the time will come when, when there'll be not one stone left upon another in the temple that will not be thrown down. Well, when will that be? The temple are the churches and the local congregations. The, the, the living stones, the precious stones in them are the true believers. But now there will come a time when they'll all be thrown down. Uh, so there will be not one left upon another. Well, that means that there's an end to the churches and congregations insofar as God using them. And again, please read Second Thessalonians 2 where God talks about the man of sin, who can only be Christ, or only be Satan, the man of sin taking his seat in the temple. When, but, when, he, said, when he said in John, John 10, verse 16, Other sheep I have, which is not of this fold, T-H-I-S, this particular fold that he's speaking of, according to English that I understand and speak, well, you see, them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. Well, that's true. You see, I, Jesus began ministering and spent most of his time ministering just to the Jews, and and uh, there were uh, there were a number of Jewish believers. But Christ's intention was that the gospel was to go into all the world. And he's speaking of the Gentiles out there who were not uh, blood descendants of Abraham, that they would also be part of the fold of the Lord Jesus. And, and all through the church age, people have become saved all over the world. And in f fulfillment of that particular statement of the Lord Jesus, but that isn't the whole story. There's, there are other passages we have to look at that indicate uh, God's methodology to continue to build that fold right up until the end. And he doesn't do that through uh, the entire New Testament period through the churches. He does it for most of the time through the local congregations. But right at the end, it'll be done through individuals. But thank you. For calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes, I have a simple question for you. Yes. Who is God? Well, God is the, is the creator of the world. Now, we can't draw a picture of God. He always exists. It's beyond our imagination. Uh, who he might be, or how such a great being can exist. But you look at a a beautiful flower, look at an orchid, for example, or look at a beautiful rose, and and look at the beautiful fragrance and and the beautiful texture of the petals, and and then look at a little baby and how how beautiful that baby is, and then look at a goldfish, and and uh, everywhere you turn, you see things that are super beautiful, super wonderful. How did they come into existence? Now you and I, we can make something, we can design a, a uh, you can design a cake for example and, and uh, you can put it in the oven and bake it and it comes out a lovely cake. But you've had to uh, uh, put certain ingredients in there and, and it still doesn't even I approach the wonder of that orchid uh, flower that you were looking at. It, it's, 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 it, uh, it's nice, but it isn't anything at all as beautiful as some of the things we see all around us. Who, who made all of that? Who designed all of that? Who gave the peach its wonderful taste? And, and uh, the other fruit, there, the apple, uh, such a, a beautiful taste. Who gave? Who designed that? God did. And who is God? Well, he is the infinite creator. We can't see him. We know he exists. And it is the Bible that tells us that such a God exists. It tells us where this world came into being. If we didn't have a Bible, we would be wondering and wondering and wondering, how did it all happen? And but the Bible clues us in, and uh, and yet 
because it is way beyond our imagination, our mind's ability to grasp. We don't grasp it all. We just know it's true uh, because it exists and because the Bible says so. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hello? Hey, hello. Um, I have a question uh, pertaining to drunkenness um, and, and how the Word of God pertains or, or speaks about it. Because in Proverbs 31.6, it says, and I quote, Give a strong drink to who is perishing, and wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty. Remember his troubles no more. And what is the, uh, the quickest way I could drive up your ass? I'm sorry that we have this kind of a caller, but let me just explain, you know, that that it is God who designed the grapes so that fine wine can be made from it. It is God who designed grains like wheat and other grains that, uh, and hops, that beer or that, uh, that uh, a strong drink uh, like vodka or whiskey can be made from it. God designed it that way. Now, when we become a child of God, we have no need of alcohol, none because we can bring all of our cares and problems to the Lord Jesus. And, and we lean back on his almighty arms, and the stress is all gone. But God also has a care for the whole world. And here is unsaved men who are filled with stress of one kind or another, and uh, and uh, they're not about to turn to God. They don't trust God a bit. They are in rebellion. And yet God, in his kindness, has made a provision where at least they can make the life, make life a little bit more uh, 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 able to be experienced. And so a, a glass of wine can be uh, served with dinner, and the wine takes away the the uh, extreme edge of uh, of stress. It helps to relax the nerves a little bit, and so the food digests better. And uh, this is a gift of God. That is a gift of God. Now, unfortunately, the world will very frequently abuse this. If one glass of wine made me uh, 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 able to uh, enjoy my food more readily. Maybe two glasses would even help more. And uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, as more alcohol is taken, the uh, our our sensitivity uh, diminishes, and our ability to discern uh, uh, anything at all diminishes. And finally, maybe. We are, we're on our third or our fourth glass, and we're on our way to become an alcoholic. And, and so it ends up that this is abused and by the world, and you have drunkenness. But the, but the uh, idea is that it is something to benefit the world in as if it is used judicially. But now, on the other hand, when we're a true believer, that's not the way we are to go. We... Uh, it's a testimony to the fact that our trust is in Christ as we live without this. And that's why Proverbs 31, referred to by our caller, it says the, uh, that it is not for kings to drink wine or desire strong drink. And every true believer is of royal blood. We are a, a nation of kings and priests, as we read in Revelation chapter 1. And so it's not for us. That's not for us. We have a solution that's far superior to that which the world can have. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, is this Open Forum? This is the Open Forum. Go ahead with your call. 
Yes, I would like to ask you a question regarding uh, Jesus had to fill the order of Melchizedek, which was the high priest. Yes. So in order for Jesus to fulfill the order of Melchizedek, that says he was without any brother, without any mother, father, brother, or sisters, correct? Yes, that is true. Okay, so then the other part of Scripture, a lot of churches preach that Jesus had brothers and sisters. If Jesus didn't have no genealogy, obviously Jesus didn't have any brothers and sisters. Oh, well, now we have to remember that Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Man. As the Son of God, he had no father or mother or brothers or sisters or genealogy. He's from everlasting past. Uh, and he is, therefore, the eternal high priest and the eternal king. Melchizedek was a priest, a high priest, as well as a king. Now, it's true that in order to be our Savior, Christ also took on a human nature. And in his human nature, he had a mother. In his human nature, uh, and, uh, that mother was Mary. He had brothers and sisters who were half-brothers and sisters. Uh, but that was the only in his human nature. But as uh, as the eternal high priest, uh, represented by Melchizedek, the focal point is mainly on the fact that he is the Son of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes, good evening. For the man that just called in a little bit ago when you was telling you that you misinterpreted Romans 3, verse 10, 11, and 12. Yes. Doesn't verse 9 tell us that he's not talking about the Jews only? Uh, let's look at that. I'm, I, that's a good idea, just to uh, look at the context a little bit more, although the, uh, the whole statement is for all of mankind. But uh, we do read in verse 9, What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise, for we have before proved that both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Thank you. That really answers this question in a very nice way. I'd like to tell you that, uh, that for the people that saying that the, that they're really giving you a hard time about the church age, uh, I went to a church for three and a half years after I became saved, and I never heard judgment preached once in three and a half years. Well, that's not unusual, and that's one of the terrible uh, indictments God has against the church, because if they do not preach judgment, their gospel is good for nothing, the Bible says. It's... It's a gospel that can be trodden under feet of men. It is has no value. The only gospel I heard preached was that God loves everybody and let's have a good time. And I yes. just, my wife one day said, I think it's time to, to leave, and we left. So have a good day, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Hello. Oh, Brother God. God bless you. Yes. Yes. What What is your question? My question is, is, is it possible that people who can read the Bible can have faith in the Lord? Is it possible to do what reading the Bible? If you cannot read and write, can you have faith in the Lord? Oh, well, if you can't read or write, isn't it wonderful today that... We can uh, get the Bible on cassette and listen to it. In fact, if you listen to family radio regularly, we read the Bible uh, several times a day for a half hour at a time. And even during the other program, from time to time, verses are, are read from the Bible. So if you, do, you can just listen if, uh, and you're going to hear the Bible. Because every time the Bible is quoted and being uh, being stated the verse from the bible that is you're listening to the voice of god because the bible is the voice of god yes i listen to family radio from 94 and it's been getting my faith in the lord and one thing i want to let you know that the men that come on every 12 o'clock on family station yeah, could you turn your radio off? We're, we're having a little bit of feedback. Okay, the, the man can come on every okay. family yeah. station. He come on 12 o'clock in the night. They call him Jerry Anger. Yeah. Yes, I just want for I just want to I don't know how to to write. I wanted to write him to tell him that the Lord bless him. And I just want you 
God bless all of you at the family station, and may the Lord be with him. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Um, I was wondering, how do we tell our children about leaving the church when they ask questions and stuff? How do we approach that? How do we approach the problem of leaving the church? Well, just, no, just um, how we tell our children, you know, because... Oh, how want... do we tell our children? Yeah. Well, first of all, we... We want to uh, to uh, be talking to our children about the importance of the Bible. Uh, we don't have to come right out with that uh, that issue. First, we want to be talking to them again and again. Children, the Bible is the Word of God. Children, we have to obey the Bible. Children, we're going to spend more time reading the Bible. And then you finally can break the news to them. And you know, when we read the Bible, we're, we do discover that they're, they're, the time has come when God is finished with the churches and congregations and, and that we're not to go anymore. We're getting this not, not uh, uh, because somebody is saying this, but because this is what the Bible is saying. And you know, children, we've been trying to be more and more obedient to the Bible, and now we have to be obedient. Uh, in a lot of ways, we don't like it because it's in the church. We have our friends, and, and that's what we're accustomed to do. But, you know, when we love the Lord, we want to, be, we want to obey the Lord. And you might give us an illustration. We go back to the book of Genesis when Jacob had to leave the land of Canaan to come into Egypt. Uh, and he didn't like that at all, but he, because uh, God had promised him and his seed the land, and yet God had told him to go into Egypt, and that would be one illustration. And my daughter wants to ask you a question. Yes. How come we can't see God? How can we do what? How come we can't see God? How come we can't see God? How come we can't see Him? Mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't see Him because God is in heaven and God is spirit. And, uh, and in fact, if we could see Him, we wouldn't be able to even live in His presence because, excuse me, He is so glorious. He is so glorious. But we can see Him in a real way by reading the Bible. You, you read the Bible, and every time when you read something about God in the Bible, and there's a lot about God there, just remember, God is telling us about Himself, so we get an idea who He is and, and how we are to, to uh, uh, live before Him. And the way we see God is through the Bible. Spend a lot of time reading the Bible. But now we've come to the end of our time until our next open forum. May the Lord richly bless you. Good night.